the last syllable when you <laughs> well, every town I go from 1984, every town is this kill and that kill. Yeah, I wonder why. Uh, what does it mean? kill and that kill. And then I think it's a Native American one. Uh, look it up. Yeah. I think it's Dutch. Dutch? Okay. Okay. It's all Greek to me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're just about ready to read. Um, how do I say this? 189, I think. Um, It's a little sad, I guess. No, it's very sad. So we're going to talk about, on 189, we talk about how Hashem comes to Jacob again when he is at Bethel and he changes his name. We discussed that a little bit last week. He gives him another blessing, prayer of to be fruitful and multiply. Um, we're going to get back to that verse because it ties it. We'll get back to fruitful and multiply. We'll get back to that. We'll start with Rash. Rashi says, um, Rashi says that if you look, for example, at verse, verse 11 on page 189, so it's chapter 35, verse 11, the verse says like this. So God said to him, I am El Shaddai, be, truth, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a congregation of nations shall descend from you. So what is a nation and congregation of nations? In Hebrew, Goy, Ukahal Goyim. Um, a nation and a congregation of nations. People think that Goy is Yiddish for uh, Gentile, but it's not Hebrew for Gentile. Goy, it's funny how the Yiddish changed the word. Goy means nation. Goyim means nations. So usually in the Torah, this is an exception. Usually Goy is the Jewish people and Goyim is the nations, is the nations of the world. And what Yiddish does, if goyim is plural, nations of the world, then how do you say in singular member of the nations of the world? You say goy, but really it's not accurate because goy doesn't mean an individual person. Goy means an individual nation, which is the Jewish people. You see what I'm saying? So they took the word goyim, which is plural, and they make it, and, and, and that's how you get goy as a Gentile in, in, in Yiddish, not in Hebrew. In this case, both goy, nation, and a congregation of nations, Congregation of Goyim all comes, refers to the Jewish people, will come from, emerge from Jacob. And then he says, and kings will emerge, will, and kings shall issue from your loins. So Rashi says, what does it mean a nation and a congregation of nations? If you say nation, it means the Jewish people. What does it mean nation and congregation of nations? Rashi says it's talking about a, a three, it's talking about a specific blessing for more children. And did Jacob have any more children? Yes, he had Benjamin. After the story, he had Benjamin. So that, he says, that's goy, that's nation. What's congregation of nations? Minimum plural is two, so you need another two. Who's the other two? Menashe and Ephraim. Joseph has two children, Menashe and Ephraim, not born yet. Jacob, later on in the Torah, in the end of Genesis, tells, tells Jacob tells Joseph that your two sons will be like my sons. Why he does that, we'll see in a minute. It's related to what happens on the next page. In any case, in some sense, Menashe and Ephraim are considered the tribes. And we still left with 12 tribes because for many, 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 and many um, related to many concepts, um, Levi is not counted because Levi doesn't get a portion of the land of Israel because they're the priests. So we end up with 12 tribes. The question is, it's a very Jewish concept. We, we, we end up with 12 tribes. The question is, how do you do the accounting? We have 13, sometimes you count. Sometimes you count Levi and you count Joseph as one. Sometimes you count Joseph as two, Menashe and Ephraim, and you omit Levi. So we have to complicate everything. We have 12 tribes, that doesn't change. Question is what the 12 are. In any case, says Rashi, Goy is Benjamin. Congregation of, of nations is Menashe and Ephraim because it says, will emerge from you. Will emerge means they were not born yet. That's what Rashi, that's, what, that's how Rashi reads it. We'll get back to it because it's related to, next, to, next, to, next, um, to the next verse. And um, Jacob in verse 14, so they said the next page. Jacob in um, verse 14 says, Jacob fulfills the vow that we spoke about the last few weeks. Jacob had set up a pillar at the place where God had spoken with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a libation of oil, a, a libation upon it, and he poured oil upon it. So he puts the stone and they put oil on the stone. The question is, what does pouring oil on the stone represent? 
And he does so also on 20 years earlier, before he left Egypt, before he left Israel, before he left Israel, of course, oil. So what does the stone represent? We discussed this, the stone and the altar. I don't want to get into that again. But oil, comment, some of the commentaries explain, Kabbalistic commentaries, that pouring oil on the stone represents God's presence. Because what is oil? Oil represents wisdom, enlightenment. Because you have, um, first of all, oil itself. Great creates oil itself. This shemen is, is, is synonymous with light, which is synonymous with, with, with wisdom and enlightenment. Some of the commentaries say it also represents the concept of prophecy, that enlightenment, divine wisdom could come and interact with people. And that's what the oil on the stone represents. The oil is enlightenment. God is pouring oil, representing the fact that God will come and pour his wisdom on the people. Uh, we're reading Maimonides because we, we read three chapters of Maimonides a day. We started again last week. And yesterday's section of Maimonides, Maimonides talks about the principle of faith that God communicates to people through prophecy. Without that principle of faith, there's no Judaism, right? There's no religion, period, but there's no Judaism. Judaism is predicated upon revelation. God makes his will known to people, which is a principle of faith. Not everyone, not all the philosophers agree with it. In other words, philosophically speaking, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be sound. Why would God, who is infinite, communicate with people? It's just too much of a gap. But in any case, foundation of Judaism, one of Maimonides' 13 principles of faith is that God communicates to people through prophecy. And at least according to some of the commentaries, that's what the oil on the stone represents. So you have the enlightenment on the stone on the physical. Okay? So that is, that is a little bit for verse 14. Okay. Um, Jacob, verse 15, we have a little bit of problem with verse 15. Then Jacob called the name of the place where God had spoken with him that day. What's the problem with this verse? Go ahead. Sorry, so is that why they also would anoint kings that way? Would you like some coffee? Do we have any other room? Um, yeah, so they anointed kings. It represents that you want the divine wisdom and divine protection to, to uh, rest on the king. Correct. Correct. So that, that's a very good point that there was in, in uh, there's a, that's how they appointed kings. That's also how they appointed, um, they anointed the priests when they were inaugurated. And not just the priests, but also the vessels of the Mishkan. And they, for the first time they, they, they used the vessels of the Mishkan, they put oil on every, each and every vessel to sanctify it. Why oil? So oil somehow represents the wisdom, the divine presence. And that ties into what Jacob did here. Um, verse 15 is a little bit of a problem. As I mentioned, Jacob refers to the name of the place that Hashem spoke to him, Beit El. Um, what's the problem with that verse? Because he already named that place Beit El earlier. So it's like he came to the places we're doing everything. It's like he forgot, he forgot he did it 20 years earlier. The problem is that we, we have the record. And we know that 20 years earlier, when Hashem spoke to him on the way out of Israel, the verse says clearly, he referred to that, he referred to that space, Beidel, the house of God. Now he comes back 20 years later. And he, again, it says he called that name of the place Beidel. So just if you want to take a peek. You don't have to, but if you want to take a peek, just make sure that... Um, Yeah, it's actually interesting. The same verses happen again. If you want, go back to page 147, you don't have to. You can trust me if you want to. I don't recommend it, but you could. Verse 18, Jacob arose early in the morning, right after he had the vision of the ladder, the, the, the vision of the ladder, and, and, Hashem, and Hashem spoke to him, and Hashem promised him protection. So the verse reads, Jacob arose early in the morning and took the stone that he placed around his head and set it up as a pillar, and he poured oil on its top. He did that 20 years earlier. He's doing that now as well. And he named that place Bethel. However, Luz was the city's name originally. So Jacob names it Bethel. 20 years later, um, 20 years later, the verse says almost the exact same thing. Almost the same thing in 16, the verse says, I'm sorry, verse 15, <clears throat> Jacob called the name of the place where God had spoken with him Bethel. Um, is this exact same word? Okay, so what is it? Is he doing the same thing again? The commentaries say, I'll tell you what they say. I'm just trying to figure out if you see it in the verses. The commentaries say that when you say place, what does the place mean? Place could be a very specific place, or it could be more of a general place. So he says he named the place Beitel. What's which place? The place where he slept? So that little mountain, Temple Mount, whatever it was. How how much, how much of the space? So they want to say that when it says the first time around, when he called the name of the place, the place that, got, that he slept, that was a very limited place. When he comes back, now 
because we had that whole discussion last week that God told him to go to this specific place. He thought God could speak to you, can connect to God every, anywhere, but God says, no, that's a unique place. So now when it says that he called the place where God spoke to him, Beit El, that's the city or the town or the region, but it's a broader space. It's not the same, it's not, it's not the same space. That's what some of the commentaries say to explain why he's naming the, the place again after he already did. Okay, fine. Now we get to the sad story. What's the sad story? The sad story is that Rachel passes away. Well, Rachel gives birth and in child, she dies in childbirth. So, and Jacob buries her right there. We'll read the verses, see what happens. 16, they journeyed from Bethel and there was still a stretch of land to go to Ephrat when Rachel went into labor and had difficulty in her childbirth. And it was when she had difficulty in her labor that the midwife said to her, have no fear, for this one too is a son for you. This is also a son. The verse continues, and it came to pass as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Ben Oni. But his father called him Benjamin, Benjamin. Thus Rachel died and was buried on the road. Um, to Ephrat, which is Beit Lechem. Jacob set up a monument over her, her grave. It is the monument of Rachel's grave until today. Okay, so that's the story. This story is a strange story. Um, sad story, but it's also a strange story. What, is it, what are the obvious questions when you read the story? First of all, why, did, why is she buried on the road? Take her to town, right? Especially at the Torah. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. How far it is from Beit Lechem, how far it is from from Ephrath, let's talk about that. Okay, so why is she buried on the road? Question number one. Question number two, the poor woman, she gave the, the, the kid a name and the father changes the name, which is very unusual because all the other names of the tribes, the mother's names. We look through a portion of the Vayetze, two portions ago, every single name, it says the mothers gave the name. Here too, the mother gave the name. So now she's got, she can't call the name. So you're gonna <laughs> call him, you're gonna call, he, he changes the name, which just, just doesn't seem like the right thing to do. Reminds me of my children, speaking specifically to my youngest daughter. She has two names, Miriam Yuta, named after my mother, my, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, and Hani's maternal grandmother. Depending on which grandmother is home, if you don't emphasize that name, you get into trouble, right? So Hani's mother comes, you have to, you must say Yuta, God forbid not to say the second name. So the point here is, because the person's gone, that's why you're not gonna name the, the you're gonna change the name, it just doesn't, it just doesn't, doesn't uh, doesn't seem, doesn't seem right. And the Torah emphasizes it so well, as if it's something good. So we, that's, that's one of the things we have to deal with. Um, is, is there a possibility to bury the rose because the, the emphasis was to bury the person and the town was too far away? Right, so let's talk about how far the town was. That could be, that's a, that, that's a good that's, that's a thing. How do we know how far, how far the town is? It all depends on a word that's very unusual in the Torah. The word is, the word is um, by ye kivrat eretz. Um, where is it? By ye kivrat eretz, verse 16. And it was a stretch of land. A stretch of land, I don't know what a stretch of land is. It's just an English translation. But there is kivrat eretz. Depending on that, what that word means, that would depend how far you think she was, they were from the town of Bethlehem. And then, 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 then you, that can help you understand why they buried perhaps. But I have to say the joke of not a joke. Joke, uh, um, also not a joke, but sad story. True story, but a sad story. Hani's brother, no, I'm kidding, it's not that sad. Hani's brother has three names, Yaakov Yehuda Leib. The reason why he has three names is because he's named after two separate people. And there was one middle name with his overlap. So his mother refers to him as Yaakov Yehuda, that's her uncle. His father refers to him as Yehuda Leib. Middle name and third. So mother says first and second, and, and father says second and third. So this kid has two names. So that's the thing. You've got the conflict of, of uh, Ma, ben, Rachel calls him Ben Oni and son of Ma. How do they translate it? The son of Ben Oni, they don't translate, we'll get to Rashi in a second. And the father changes the name. So that's also, that's also, a, uh, that's also something we have to discuss. Um, okay, let's start from the beginning. So they, would, they, they travel from Beit El and where are they going to? They're going, I presumably to Hebron, because that's where Isaac is, right? Isaac is, Isaac is, they have to go back to Jacob's father, he hasn't seen him in 20 years. And they were delayed a little bit of Shechem, 
they would ladle it on Shechem, and then God, after the story of Shechem, that God says, go to Beit El, fulfill your vow, so he goes to fulfill the vow. But now, he's traveling home. So he's traveling home, and he's in the region of Beit Lechem, and there's a Kivra to Aretz. There was a stretch of land to come to Ephrat, and, um, and Ephrat is Beit Lechem. Today, Ephrat is not Beit Lechem, different, different, different town. But that's what the verse says, verse 19 says, says um, Rachel died and was buried on the road to Ephrat, which is Beit Lechem. So Ephrat is synonymous with Beit Lechem. So there's a distance between, between um, where they were to Beit Lechem is Kivrat Eretz. What does Kivrat Eretz mean? I'm going to read Rashi and I'm going to read Nachmanides. And the reason why this is Nachmanides is so beautiful, you'll see in a minute why Nachmanides is so beautiful. So first thing you do is, is um, first thing you do is when Rashi doesn't, understand, doesn't know, and it's not a common word, how do you know what, a, again, I always say this, there's no biblical, there's no dictionary for biblical Hebrew. So if there's an unusual word, if there's a word that appears often, you could see from the context what it means. Then there are words that are, do not appear often. They appear once or twice in the Bible, once in the five books of Moses, once or twice in the Bible. Then you get into trouble. And what you do is you look for a friend. That's what Rashi says. He's, he uses the term, I didn't find a friend. I did find a friend. What's a friend? You find a similar word and you can say whatever that other word means based on that context. You could try to try to try to um, try to um, deduce the, the meaning of the word. Now, when Rashi gets into trouble, so sometimes he looks for another word. So that's, some, that's some of the things he does. Sometimes he looks at the Unkulus, which is the Aramaic translation of the Torah, which was um, written 200 years before Rashi, probably 900 years before Rashi. And then um, sometimes he goes to the more recent commentators and there were two people that he called, that he used to go to. One, ninth, I believe it's the ninth century um, scholar named Menachem, I like the name because it's my name, Menachem ben Saruk. And he wrote what they called Machberet, which in modern Hebrew, Machberet is a, a notebook. And, but machberet is an interesting word because it comes from the word chibur, which chibur it could mean uh, connecting, but chibur could also mean a uh, uh, like 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 chibur is like putting together a piece of work, a piece of art. So machberet, basically, it's the first attempt to create a dictionary for biblical Hebrew. That's what that's what that's what he did. So all those unusual words, it's available today. You can find it on the internet. All the unusual words he quotes, and he says what it means and what are the, what are the you know, what, con what context it's used in. Um, so Rashi, as soon as Rashi says Menachem, you know they're ready to the problem. It's not, it's not a common word. He's also someone else in Arabic named Dunash ben Mabart, who disagreed with Menachem ben Saruk. Sometimes he quotes both. Here he just quotes Menachem. But, but you see right away, it's an issue. It says Rashi, Menachem says, Lashon Kabir, Kibrat, comes in the word Kabir. And Kabir is, Kabir is, in modern Hebrew, Kabir is massive, right? Massive. So what it's saying is a long distance. That's what Menachem says. Why is Menachem saying this? Exactly what Steve is saying, I think, right? We want to justify why they don't take her to town, right? So if the verse means there was a great distance to Beit Lechem, then you understand why they buried her on the road. That's, what, that's, that's, what, that's the first thing, that, that's, that's, that's the first interpretation. Then he brings the Medrash, that Kivrat comes from the word Kvara, which is, um, Kvara is, is a, Kvara, I believe, is like a tool that makes holes in the ground. And, no, I'm sorry. Kvara is a sifter. So the sifter has holes. That's how you sift. And the point is, it's the season where the earth was plowed. So it's not telling you the time. It's telling you, it's telling you the season when she passed away. When the, when the, before the rain season, but after the summer, when the earth is already plowed, so it has holes like a sifter. That's the next thing Rashi says. Um, Rashi says, no, that's not the simple meaning, because simple meaning gets a distance. Says Rashi, it is a, it is a period, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a the word kivrat doesn't mean, and it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a word that means either massive or a lot, massive or holes. It's simply a certain measurement of land. That's what Rashi says. And he say, he brings another verse, and he brings another word, verse um, that from Isaiah that has that word as well. So it's a certain, a certain distance. So that's what Rashi says. So we end up with Rashi, we're not sure. We're not sure what the word means. It can either mean a great distance, 
Okay, we, now we're learning. So take a chair with Lentor. Okay. <laughs> okay, so sit down and bring Lentor. We know about Kriba Kriba Rafa, very little. So, so, so it could either mean, <laughs> it could either mean that it's a distant land or it's a certain period of time. That's what Rashi says. And again, why would you yeah. want to say it's distant? Why would you want to say it's distant? To say exactly what Steve was saying. But I'm quoting from the Ramban. Ramban says this is, Ramban says it's beautiful. So, so he quotes Rashi, and then he says like this, another interpretation, who says this interpretation? Of David Kuchi, the Radak. Adak was also a great scholar in the, I think, I think, I think it's later, so probably the 12th century, um, the, the early 11th century. And he says, Kivrat is similar to the word, drop the chaf, chaf is like. Barat is like eating. In all over the Torah, have rainy lechem, give me, give me, give, give me food to eat, give me bread to eat. Basically, Rashi says, as long as it takes, basically, the Adak says, as long as it takes to eat. The amount of time that it takes to eat breakfast, kivrat eretz, as much time as it would take to eat a little food, that's how much space that they measured space. That's his interpretation. All I'm trying to say is nobody knows what this is. What I want to say something beautiful is like this. He says about Nachmanides. He says this part of his commentary. He says that's what I wrote earlier. So he wrote what he wrote his commentary. But we know that Nachmanides' life story is that he, he always wanted to move to, Jew, to Israel. And the end of his life, he moved to Israel and he lived there for a few months and he died in Israel. A few months, a few years, I don't remember. I think a few months. He died in Israel. Mm-hmm. Says Nachman is like this. It says now, now that I merited and I came to Jerusalem, right? Now, there's no, there's no, uh, they were sitting in Spain. Nobody, Marashi was never in Israel. Gardak was never in Israel. Menachem and Sorok was never in Israel. So they're trying to get knowledge from the verses. But the Ramban says, I have an advantage. I would merit it. I came to, I came to, to Jerusalem. Shevach El Adov, praise, praise the good God. Right? And I saw with my own eyes that from the burial of Rachel, Rachel's burial, to Beit Lechem, there is not even a meal. Not even a meal is less than a mile. So he says, so Menachem Ben Sarek's interpretation was disputed. It's not a massive amount of land, right? Because I saw it, so, 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 so you have to say that's like what Rashi says that Kivrat is the, a certain measurement of land. So I thought that was beautiful that he came back, he wrote his commentary in Spain, and he came to Jerusalem and he revisited it. He said, it can't be the first thing he did. He ran to, he ran to, um, he ran to, Jeru- to, to measure the distance. Um, I, there's, a, there's a biblical scholar, religious guy in Israel. And I was listening to his lectures. I like listening to his lectures. And he says that, and he's always, always like, you, got, you have to really, really walk the land to understand what the Tanakh is saying. And basically he said that as soon as they heard that they, that, uh, that they signed an agreement, peace agreement with, with Egypt, to give back the Sinai Desert. So I got into my car, I drove down there and all his questions that he had about where the Jews traveled and where they didn't travel, he spent months there because he figured they're gonna give it back, it's gonna go away and you have to walk it to understand it. So that's what the Ramban did. He showed up to Jerusalem. He went and he walked and he saw how far it is from Beit Lechem to the burial of Rachel. And he says, it cannot be that it's a massive amount of land. Um, it's, it's, it's a short period of time. It's not even a meal. A meal, I think, in Halacha takes like a, what, the, I don't think it's, I think it's like 22 minutes to walk. It's not, it's, not, it's not a big deal. So that just brings to the question of why they didn't bury her. Why, why didn't they bury her? Um, in Beit Lechem, if not in Hebron. Okay, so Hebron is a distance. It takes an hour to drive. Hebron is a distance. Go ahead. Is it possible that he chose to bury her in the road because he possibly the inhabitants would not be friendly to the other? That could be. That could be. It's, it's unusual because burial, the whole idea of burial is to have a sort of a permanent resting place. And, and, the, and, the rap, and, the say, and the patriarchs were sensitive to this. And that's why Abraham never bought land in Israel. He only bought land in Israel when it came to burial, right? So we understand that Rebecca on the last page, Re- Rebecca's, uh, Rebecca's uh, his, his nurse was buried under a tree. Okay, I'm sorry, Devorah. Devorah, Rebecca's nurse. 
Okay, so she wasn't she wasn't in the family. She wasn't a matriarch. But she, now here, so here's a little different. She's on the road. He puts them on Seba. He puts a a memorial to this day, so we know where it is. Some people say that's why we hear about Rebecca's path, um, 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 Deborah's passing to begin with. The contrast here, they bury her. Here, even though she's buried on the side of the road, but they have a, they have a matzeva, they have a, a, a monument, a memorial to this day. But in any case, that we understand. But here, to bury her just because, say that people, they didn't own any real estate in Beit Lechem. So go negotiate, go negotiate, go negotiate, negotiate a purchase, right? So that's, that's the question. So there's the famous Medrash. The Medrash basically says, doesn't say it over here. The Medra says, the Medra says it later in the story with, with, when, when Jacob's about to pass away. When Jacob's about to pass away, he calls Joseph, right? You know the Medra. She calls Joseph and he says, take me out of Egypt, bury me back in Machpelah, in the cave of Machpelah, in, in Hebron, the burial spot of my ancestors. And then he says like this, he says, he says like this, let me read it. So on page 271, again, I'm going to read it. You don't have to look at chapter 48 in Genesis, chapter 48, um, verse 7. So earlier in the previous page, page 269, he calls his son and he makes him promise. Right in verse 30, he said, um, for I will lie down with my fathers and you shall transport me out of Egypt and bury me in, the in, in their tomb. Um, by that with my fathers. So basically bury me where my fathers are. He said, I personally will do as you have said. He replied, swear to me. And he swore to him. Then Israel prostrated himself toward the head of the, of the bed. Then he blesses his sons. Okay, without getting into that too much, we'll go to verse seven. Verse seven, um, on page 271. But as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died on me in the land of Canaan on the road, while there was still a stretch of land. Same word, road kivrat eretz, a stretch of land to come. Um, to go to Ephrat, and I buried her there on the road to Ephrat, which is Bethlehem. Now the question is, um, why is what is he saying, and why is he saying it? Like, what? Why does he have to mention that? We all know the story. So Rashi <clears throat> says that Jacob senses that Joseph is could be upset, but you're asking me to take you from where? From Egypt to Israel. Meanwhile, his mother, Joseph's mother Rachel, you didn't even take her to to town. Either to either to um, Hebron, but but even not to Beit Lechem. So according to Rashi, Jacob is sort of getting defensive by tell, by retelling the story, reopening and retelling the story of Rachel. Uh, the problem is that the verse there doesn't explain why; it just says the fact. So we know that this is on the table. This is an issue on the table that Jacob senses that Rachel may be um, that 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 Joseph may be upset. So there, Rashi says like this. Rashi says. Um, I just want you to know that I did so based on Hashem's words. In other words, basically, it's a prophecy from Hashem to bury her there on the road. Why? Says Rashi that when the Jewish people would, are going to be exiled, they're going to from Jerusalem. They'll pass through that road and pray, and and when when and see Rachel, see Rachel's tome, and Rachel sort of prays for her children. And Rashi quotes the verses in Jeremiah chapter thirty-one. Beautiful verses where it says, Rachel Rachel's trying, crying for her children, and Hashem comforts her, and he says, Yes, Sahar the Pulatech, there's going to be reward for your, for, your, for your actions, and the Shavu Banim the Gulam, and the children will come back to their borders. In other words, Rashi is saying that this is by Hashem's command, so it's prophecy why he was buried there, and it's encouragement for the Jews when they're going to have to go to exile. That's Rashi's interpretation from the Medrash. Because again, the Torah doesn't say, it doesn't say why, keeps reiterating. Uh, like I said, it says it in the first time, it says it again when, jo when Jacob is speaking to, the to, the to when Jacob is speaking to um, Joseph, but he again recounts the story. So obviously it was an issue, it was something that they, that they were, could, that, that, that Jacob sensed that Joseph would be uncomfortable with. So he says, contrasts what he's, what, what, what he's asking Joseph to do for him, for what Jacob did to Joseph's mother. And, but it doesn't explain. So then you need the Medrash. The verse doesn't say it. Okay, so what do we do with this? So I saw two other interpretations. Well, not two other, just to add a little bit. So 
One interpretation is if you look at the boundaries and see where Beit Lechem is and where the burial of Rachel is. I forget who says it, but somebody says this. Beit Lechem is clearly in the tribe of Judah. You know that it says it says it in the book of Ruth, other places. Beit Lechem, no, even David, Ben Yishai was from Beit from Lechem. So Beit Lechem is tribe of Judah. Um, if you bury Rachel in Beit Lechem, that's in the territory of Judah. Hebron is also territory territory of Judah. The road was the border with the tribe with the territory of Benjamin. So Judah is the son of Leah. And Benjamin, son of Rachel, of course. So he buries her in the land that's destined to be belong to her descent. That is one interpretation that I saw. Another interpretation is that if you look at what it's basically, basically telling you, explaining the Medrash, making the Medrash more practical. What does it mean that Rachel's on the road and the Jewish people are going to exile and they see Rachel. If Rachel doesn't see the Jewish people traveling through, then she won't know that they're going to exile. Like what exactly, what exactly is the Medrash saying? And so somehow it's some encouragement for the Jewish people. So they see Rachel's tongue. Okay, what does it really mean? So some people say that if you look at Rachel's life, on one hand, it's a tragedy. We'll talk about the sadness and the joy coming together. But on one hand, her life is a tragedy because she almost never had what she wanted, right? She wanted children and she dies in childbirth. She doesn't come back to Israel. It's just, it's just if you think about it, it's very tragic. On the other hand, what Rachel represents is even though she didn't have what she wanted, but she never gave up. In other words, she understood, was always trying to achieve what her, 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 her goals. And what Rachel represents is that you may not get to the end of the road. You may, you may you, you're, you're on the road, you didn't reach your destination, but there's meaning to the journey. And eventually your effort is going to bear fruit. May not be now, maybe in the future, maybe in the distant future, but understand just because you're not at your destination, it's not because you had a dead end, you're on a road. And Rachel being on the road is what really God is telling her. God, God is telling her, don't worry, yes, eventually there's reward to, your, to, you, to what you're doing because your children will come back. So in some sense, all of our life is Rachel on the road. Certainly all of Jewish history is Rachel on the road. We are not, we have not yet reached our destination. So you can look at that and say, so we, we, we're not achieving anything. Or you could look at that and say, no, like Rachel understood her whole life, even if you'd have the challenge right now, but the challenge is a road. You're not done. The story is not over. It's going to lead to something in the future. And that imagery is what Rachel represented. And that's what the Jewish people need to understand when they're going to exile. Right? When they were kids, they told us, well, they're going to pray for, they're going to pray on Rachel's tongue. That's not what it says. It's not what Rashi says. It says Rachel would see them and, 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 and then God will promise Rachel, don't worry, there's reward Hashem, to your actions and the children will come home. By the way, I think you, yeah, you come to Ben Gurion Airport, the arrivals, you have this verse hanging. Children, the sons will come back to their boundaries, referring to the missing soldiers, I think. But in any case, so that's a very beautiful verse in, in Jeremiah 31. But in any case, what I'm trying to say here is, is that it's, it's, uh, it's symbolic for the Jewish people in exile. Understand we're on the road. And we're not, we, didn't reach yet, we didn't reach a destination, but we're still on the journey. That's the encouragement for the Jewish people, and that will, that's what Rachel personifies. And if you, you wouldn't get that message if you buried her in a permanent place. In some ways, in some ways we're not permanent. In some sense, we're still on the road. And, that, and, that, and that's, and that's the, the teaching, and that's the imagery of burying her on the road. Again, according to the Medrash, based on Hashem's, Hashem's direct. I just have one question, yeah. just slight, slight deviation from the Torah. What, what is called house of God? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's what that's what that's what they were famous for. I don't know. Even today you have the bread basket, you have, you have, you have bakeries, Beit Lechem, place where it's hospitable, it could be a hospitable place. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe somebody I have my computer here can Google it, but maybe we'll Google it, try to figure it out. Okay, so that is a little bit about Rachel, Rachel's, Rachel's burial. 
um, there's a beautiful Malvin here. The Malvin says like this. Verse 20, page 191, says, Jacob set up a monument over her grave. It is the monument of Rachel's grave until today. Is that the way you speak Hebrew or English? You say a monument of someone's grave? Or do you say, or do you say it's a monument for the person? Right? You say this is the person's matseva. Here it says, it's the matseva of the Kura. It's the monument of the burial. That's sort of an extra word that doesn't usually fit. So what the Malvin says is like this. Most people, when you put a bear, why do you put, why do you put a stone? You put a stone to remember the person. It says, for Rachel, you don't need that. She's the matriarch. So her children always remember her. Her good deeds stand for her. So you don't need a monument to remind you of Rachel. You need the monument to remind you of where she's buried. Different thing. So it's the Matseva for her burial. It's the monument for a burial. It's not the monument for her. And of course, what the sages say that you don't have to make a monument for, for righteous people because their good deeds are their memory, right? So it's a very, inter it's an interesting, it's an interesting subtlety that Rachel, some people, most people need a monument so you shouldn't be forgotten. But Rachel, you don't need the monument, you don't need a monument for that. For her, you don't need a monument to remember her because, because she lives on through her children. The monument is simply, is simply um, where, she, where she would be buried, which is, which is different than say, just sort of a technical space to know where, where she's buried, but it's not really, uh, that doesn't capture her own, her own memory, which is much deeper than the physical space. It's, it's within her children, within her family, and within the Jewish people. Okay, yeah, I think that's, that's what we have to say about, about, um, about the burial. Oh, no, of course not. We have the other issue with the names, okay? Verse 18, and it came to pass as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Ben-Oni, but his father called him Ben Yamin. Ben Yamin. So Ben Oni, Ben Yamin. At least you could say that it's uh, it's close enough, right? It sounds it sounds it sounds similar enough. But the reality is that certainly with the translation, it's completely different. Ben Oni. What is Oni? So there are different meanings of of Oni. But Rashi says Ben Saari, the son of my sorrow, Sar pain. Right, and you know what? She, she's dying in, in childbirth. She names him Benoni, son of my Sarah. And Jacob changes the name to the son of my right hand. The right hand is strength. Right hand is also Rashi has the thing when you're coming down. Um, right hand represents Israel. And if you're coming from the direction he was coming from, the right hand would be Israel. And he says the son of my right hand, meaning the son of Israel, to highlight the fact. That he was the only son, that he was the only one of the 12 tribes born in Israel. But again, so here you have a completely different extreme. On one hand, she's giving him a name of sorrow, of sadness. And he's saying right hand, strength. So, 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 so what do you do here? What do we do with this? Go ahead. I mean, I'm just thinking. Yeah. Uh, I used to think of my wife as my right hand. Right. Given, given her contribution to the family. Right. And certainly that he saw his his Rachel's children, his love to Rachel is passed on to Rachel's children, as you see in the next parsha. Next parsha is Joseph, right? Joseph and Benjamin was way more protective of Joseph and Benjamin than the other children because his wife passed away and she was the one she he loved most. So in some sense, maybe that name is actually what you're what you're suggesting is that name. To Benjamin is really um, expanding his love to Rachel, and and sort of projecting that onto Benjamin. That 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 could be, yeah. But again, how would you change it? The poor woman gave her gave a name. You're going to go and change it. So there's a very interesting interpretation that says like this in Hebrew. The word it's very strange, but it's but but but, but it is the case. And how that works, we'll talk about that. We'll try to talk about that in a minute. But in Hebrew, the word own. Ben Oni 
the word own could be could be pain, it could be sin, but it can also mean strength. It means strength. So basically the name has different meanings embedded in it. So it could mean, like Rashi says, the son of my sorrow. It could also mean the son of my strength. Ben Oni, like uh, um, uh, in Isaiah, we say it in the Haftar of the fast days, multiple times a year, uh, multiple times a year. Uh, a wicked person should, should, uh, should, should, I guess, uh, should, should leave his wicked ways and the strong man his thoughts. Um, yes, yeah, so the strong man, someone thinks he's, he's powerful. So the word aven is strength. That's a legitimate interpretation of the word aven. It also means sorrow. It also means sin. Talk about how they all relate. But what, what this commentary is doing, multiple people say this, he's not really changing the name. He's highlighting one meaning of the name that, his, that, that, that Rachel gives. So Ra Rachel says the son of Oni, which could mean sorrow. And he says, Ben Yamin, son of my right hand, right hand represents strength. He's not disagreeing with Rachel, but he's picking one possible interpretation of the name that he gives, that he gives. Okay, so that's already a sort of, a, it, uh, it um, makes it easier to swallow that he's changing the name. Um, but if you think about this, this has a tremendous amount of a tremendous amount of symbolism, because here obviously she was referring to the pain, right? Because she was in pain, she was not, obviously we assume that she was thinking. Rashi says it's the son of my pain, but the fact that in the pain there's also positivity, right? In every situation, that's a very deep Jewish belief that in every challenge there's also blessing in disguise. So you're looking at the same scenario and you're looking at the same word. And you could look at it as sorrow, but you could look at it as strength. And the question is what the reader wants, how the reader wants to see it. And Jacob, what Jacob is trying to do is Jacob is trying to highlight the joy. And in general, this whole scene is a scene of sorrow and joy. On one hand, the mother dies. On the other hand, the child that she was waiting for is, is, is born. So how do you deal with this scenario? Is this a happy day? Is it a sad day, right? It's very, it's very, it's very, it's very, um, very deep and mixed emotions. And the question is, you have to choose what emotion to highlight. My aunt, my grandfather, who I'm named after, died very young. He died when my father was, the oldest son was 10. And my aunt, I think he died on the birthday of my aunt, either the, that day or the day or one day off. And she was two years old, she was the youngest. And so the, her birthday was the day her father died. She told me she never had a birthday in her life. Right? It's very. You, I'm, I'm just. I'm just saying. You could think about this. Think about this child, Benjamin, who on one hand, so his mother, his mother died. He's born on his mother on his mother's day of passing. It's. It's it, on one hand, it's very sad. On the other hand, he's the twelfth child. He's his, his mother wanted the child. His mother loved him, was waiting for him, anticipated him. So what are you? Gonna, you can't have the child just live in sorrow. You have to give the child joy, and you have to give the child happiness. So that's what the father is doing. The father is saying, yes, there's sadness here, but there's happiness here as well. And I think that's a very, very important trait and a Jewish trait, but that's what the father is trying to do by highlighting the, the again, the meaning, the positive meaning in the name. He's not, it's not that he's negating the pain, right? He's not taking a different name that negating what Rachel said, but it's more of highlighting the positive in the story. And that's why the word oh, 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 the, the, um, um, own could be negative. It could also be strength. And, and, and he's highlighting the positive. So I think that's beautiful. Now we could talk about in a second that it takes this question. And we'll talk about how it works. How do you get that spectrum in, in, in Hebrew? So it's very interesting. There's, I'll give one theory, but there are other, th there are other theories. Um, I have here a book. I have it here because I use it for the Hebrew school. It's called called uh, the people of the word. And Mark is not here, but this is right up on Sally. So it's basically 50 words. And it shows you that in Hebrew, the, the, the Hebrew meaning of the word is very different than, 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 than the English words and has different meaning, etc. And the relationship between words are different. So for example, the word I'm going to read today is the word sara, uh, the word sara, difficulty, but yeah, sara, difficulty or, or, or calamity. Is also you change the letters, change the order of letters. It's so hard. Window, and you have so many words like that. We had that 
nega oneg, plague, pleasure. Book of Formation says plague is the, the, ne the nega, the plague of Tzarat is the worst impurity and pleasure is the highest. And um, what's the word? Let's find it. He, he does like a bunch of words here. Pesha and Shefa. So sin and flow. Flow is positive. Um, all these words, the positive and the negative are the same words in just different order. Same letters in different order. And the question really is, in any situation, a negative situation, there's going to be the positive. Are you able to isolate that and see that and celebrate it? And that's what Jacob is, and that's what Jacob is trying to do here. Um, let's see if I can find that word. Um, okay, look so at this. Does that mean that. the words have the same or coming with the same? They're, they're, that? they're related. Same energy could be. In, you know, you understand that 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 a potent energy could be good or bad. Is fire good or bad? It can cause tremendous destruction. Because it's so potent, it could also cause tr tremendous positivity. And the more potent something is, the more potential it has, it could be positive or negative. Right? Something that's not so powerful is also not that destructive. Something that's more, some, you know, something that's more this person who is, uh, who is charismatic. Right? So he can cause a lot of damage. He can also cause a lot of inspiration. Right? So everything could be flowed both ways. Just to look at this book for a second. Ra is bad. Air is awakened. So then something bad happens to me, it's a wake-up call. Sara could be Tsohar, light could be Ratsa, desire. Uh, Nega, we did that. Mar, bitter, is Ram, uplift, right? So it's, it's, it's interesting that if this is like, it's like there's so many words like that where the positive and the negative are related, you change the order. This is actually stronger because this is it's the same word. You don't have to change the order of the letters. On could be strength, on could be um, sin and pain. How does that work? So if you want to know technically, I read this morning from Rabbi Shamshin Paul Hirsch and he talks about how that works. And basically this is his theory. His theory is, if I remember correctly, let's see if I can remember, I didn't write it down, but his theory is like this, that um, own, own as strength. He, he thinks like own is like is like ownership and it comes from if you own is like ownership and then and then ownership basically means you're expressing your power your might over this object and then he basically says the misappropriation of ownership if someone takes away something that belongs to somebody else that's where own becomes becomes sin you're using your force to misappropriate somebody else's possessions that's Shamshavos Hirsch's his theory about the relationship between strength and sin in the same word. So, strength is so ownership is exercising one's power, <clears throat> and then abusing one's power would be the other side of that. So, tsara, own is in the sense of ben sari, the son of my sorrow, is when somebody abuses their power against me. That's the root of the word. That's how the same word of strength could be positive and negative. Because strength means either I'm using my strength in possessing something, or I am the victim of someone else misappropriating their strength, using their strength in a negative way. That's how they both related to the same word. It's just, just like, what's the link? But the concept of what he's doing here, he's taking the negative experience and, and, and not negating her name, not coming up with a different name, but 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 coming with a, with one interpretation of her name. And that's why he steps in here. And like I said, all the other names, the mothers have given, right? This is the only name that, 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 that the father gives. Why does he give? He's giving it, he's not negating her name, he's interpreting her name. And that name happened to, st have to stick. His name is Benjamin, ben Benjamin. But what, what, what I think what the Torah could be telling us is it's not a negation of the mother's name, it's one of the interpretations. And the point is, I, in everybody's life, you have a choice. So you're gonna look at the Ben Tsar, you're gonna look at the pain, well, you're going to look at the white, the, the strength. And often our life is a mix. And how was your day? My day was also a mix. And this experience itself is a mix, right? And the question is, I have to think to choose what I, how, how I want to think about this and what I want to interpret and how, and what the takeaway is for me, right? Every, every benefit is, is, it takes a sacrifice. If I'm doing one thing, I can't do something else, right? There's always a sacrifice. You can't, you can never achieve anything without sacrifice. Sacrificing is basically saying no to other opportunities. So is that good or is it bad? 
Well, you, that's the choice, but you, that's the choice you have. A, everything in life is a mix of the pain and, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the might and the right hand. And your, your choice of what you want to highlight. And of course here, the imagery is so powerful. There's a death and a birth together in the same day, in the same moment. So is it a tragic event? Yes. Is it a happy event? Yes. I mean, so, so what are you going to highlight? Well, depends to who. For the father, it must have been sad. For the mother, certainly. For the child, you have to help them grow in a, in a positive environment, right? Otherwise, he ends up like my aunt, who's a, my favorite aunt, but very good person. But I, she heard, I didn't hear that until I was probably 30, and I was like, oh, my God, this is, this is sad. But uh, it turned out well. <laughs> but 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 someone has to someone has to tell the kid you're a kid of the right right hand you know you're not a kid of sorrow you go to their therapist what happened my mother called me my son the son, the son of her sorrow right that's going to be that's going to need a lot of therapy yeah but what did your father put oh son of my right hand okay so that's he's highlighting the positive so that's a beautiful a beautiful in, interpretation again not negating what the mother said but highlighting that in the sorrow there, there could be you have to find a positive the positive but, but, but in terms of words yeah. that, that can have different applications that are similar, doesn't context play a very important role? Yeah, context plays an important role, but in English, there's certain words, in, in Hebrew, there's certain words that are related that you would think they're not related, be they're opposites. So how do, they, how do they have the same word that you, yeah, if you, have to, you look at the context to know what the word means, but why do you have one word that could mean opposite, that has opposite, opposite um, uh, meanings? A strange concept. Who would create a language like that? Now, in English, it's not such a question because we have really crashing with multiple languages coming together. So, some words that sound similar don't really have the same roots. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But in Hebrew, it's the holy tongue. Hashem, the language we believe that it's not by convention by people, but it's Hashem creates the language. So, it has to be, it has to, you have, you'd expect much more uh, logic and coherence and, and intentionality in the language. So who does this? Who puts a word that means strength, positive strength, and means sin, and means evil, and, and pain, and puts it all, all together, right? So that's the message, perhaps, that the, that the strength is positive, strength could be negative, and then, again, the positive and the negative, positive and the negative is the external expression, but deep down, ultimately, something can go either way, and it's really how we choose to use it and interpret it. Yes, you want to question. In the back couple yes, of days, yes. if you don't mind. So the, the early Yiddishes, yeah. probably 15th century yeah. high German, how does, how does joy go from being a Jew to being a non Jew? I think that's that. Yiddish. I think it's just the, the Yiddish that looking for a word to express. I was listening to this. Who heard I was saying? It's the only, somebody was saying that it's the only language that they know of, Yiddish, where there's a word for everybody else that's not our nation. You don't have that. You have foreigner. The foreigner doesn't have to mean your nation. It could mean someone who's out of your city or your block. Or, so it's an interesting phenomenon. But I think what's part of it is the fact that, that at the end of the day, the Jewish people understand and believe that they have a, they're selected for a, a mission, so the chosen people. So then naturally, you're going to want to find a word for people who are out of that, especially when, with, the, with, the, with the persecution. All the persecution. If you're if you're a small group and anyone outside your group is sometimes justified, but sometimes unjustified, but could be a potential threat, and they come, they have to come up with the word to say he's not one of us. And I think See, that's it, what. It was my understanding that the, the Yiddish transition from high German. There were certain idiomatic things that we would say from Hebrew. Certainly that, Hebrew. Well, this disturbing and this preferred yeah. doesn't stand and it doesn't cry. Right. We're saying it's BS. Right. But if a German person heard it, it doesn't stand and it doesn't cry. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. So, you know, yeah. but we know what it means. Right, right, right. Yeah, so language expressions and languages don't always work, but I'm just saying, but but if here it's Hebrew, it's coming from the Hebrew. It's just it just it's just misinterpret just misinterpreting the Hebrew because because I tell people. They say, oh, how come Goy is derogatory? I say, really? Goy is the Torah, but first the Jewish people. And then people are confused. They don't believe me. I think I'm, I'm saying there's a little, little bit of sarcasm also in, I mean, I think Yiddish has a lot of humor. Yes. How yes. It's being, you know, it's what you're saying, but even it's almost like a euphemism. Could be. It could be. I wasn't there when they coined it, but uh, when it developed. <laughs> but uh, uh, Yes. Goy. 
In Yiddish, Goy becomes an individual Gentile. In Yiddish. But in Biblical Hebrew, Goy is a nation. So you have the nation versus the nations in plural. And the Jewish people are the nation. Atem to you, before the giving of the Torah, God tells the Jewish people, you will be for me, Mamlechet Kainim, kingdom of priests, and Goy Kadosh, a holy Goy, a holy nation. Now, we have it on this page. God tells, God tells Jacob that Goy Ukaha Goyim, a nation and a congregation of nations will come from you. So the Goy in the singular in the Bible is the Jewish people. Goyim in the plural are the nations of the world. Now, in Yiddish, what Yiddish does takes the Goyim as nations of the world. Then you say, so how do you say an individual Gentile? Well, you call him a Goy. No, that's grammatically incorrect. A Goy doesn't mean an individual of amongst the nations of the world. A Goy means a single nation. So I can't say this person is a Goy. No, this person's not a nation. This person is an individual person from the nations. But that's totally Yiddish. The Goy as, an, as, as a non-Jew is totally Yiddish. In biblical Hebrew, or in Hebrew, a Goy is a nation. And it's always, whenever it says in the Torah, it's always referring and highlighting the, the, the Jewish people. But nobody believes me. <laughs> okay, so that's a little bit about, about Rachel and about changing the name from, from, from sorrow to strength, because that is essentially, I think, what he's helping his son do and a very difficult and challenging, uh, well, tragic occurrence, but he's looking to highlight the positive. The positive. And, and that's Ben Yami, stand on my right hand. Okay, I think that's it for today. Wonderful day, everybody. Thanks for coming. We have plenty of space. So if you need to come in person, don't worry. We have space for you. We can accommodate. Uh, we have coffee. Maybe next week we'll have muffins. Thank you, Rev. Thank you, Rabbi Feldman. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Wonderful day, everybody. Yeah, really positive. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Yeah. But it's Yiddish. You have the Yiddish takes the word, the Hebrew, and changes it.